Dr. Lena from the Perimeter Institute in Canada, and Shiraz Minwala of TI for Mumbai, India. And we are going to be having an interesting session. In fact, uh, we already had a little glimpse in Kip Thorne's lecture about what Lena is going to be talking about. And also, perhaps some of you who went to the mini workshop have heard already Shiraz, half of it, I think, which is going to expand in this meeting. So, may I request Louis Lena to please give his talk on membranes and black holes from jets to cosmic censorship. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone. Um, so, bring this. Okay, so in my mind, um, there is a connection between the two kind of topics I'm going to present. Uh, hopefully, you'll, you'll go with me. Otherwise, um, just bear with me, and hopefully, I'll, I'll, it will become clear why I'm trying to connect both topics in, in one. Um, so I'm going to be talking about two different fronts. In, in talks we refer uh, from Keep and, um, and Bernie this morning, and also with uh, that of uh, Macero that will come uh, tomorrow. And then also we'll be talking about uh, black holes and instabilities, and I'll actually we'll have some connection with Shiraz's next, next talk. In both cases, um, the kind of problems I'm going to be thinking about require understanding gravity in very strong and, uh, uh, regimes and that are very highly dynamical. All, both of them will require numerical simulations, and I'm going to be uh, saying the first kind of shocking statement that I don't need to explain anything about how the numerical details are, are, are going on in the simulations because I already keep uh, talking about them. Um, and the important thing um, in, in the, the simulations in general as the field of numerical relativity is that now we're at a stage where we don't talk about what kind of physics uh, is uh, put in the simulations, but rather what kind of physics is left out. Because the simulations are at the stage where we're actually getting in contact um, in, a, in a reliable well, way with um, the systems that we're trying to simulate. And we're just beginning to add extra physics to get more information from the systems. And I, I'll mention a few examples as I go along. So first, let me um, try to connect with this membrane theme that I mentioned. And I, I keep mentioning that, okay, there is this new golden age in, in gravity research, uh, but I'm gonna be picking up and exploiting within this golden age stuff that was done in the previous golden age of gravitation. And I'm gonna be going back to some of old results and use those to excuse the kind of research I'm gonna be going after. And the first thing I'm gonna um, um, rely on, and this, this membrane paradigm that was introduced by, I'll uh, keep in particular, but um, this, this, this group of people, that noted that m many of the phenomenology that we can extract around black holes can be re-understood or reinterpreted in terms of uh, the dynamic of a stretch horizon. And in particular, you can uh, realize that some of the Eisen's equations or a combination of Eisen's equations um, actually can be described in uh, just as a Navier-Stokes equation. Um, with, um, for a particular fluid which has some very low shear viscosity. For electrodynamic uh, um, behavior, we can also reinterpret the, the, the behavior of the electromagnetic fields in terms of a description that kind of thinks of the uh, black hole horizon as a poor conductor, but a conductor nevertheless, and it has a particular resistance. So I'm gonna be uh, actually using both of them in the, in the kind of uh, stuff I'll be talking about. And more recently, this kind of connection has been exploited very strongly in the ADS-CFT conjecture, and also in recent work by Emperor Allen Co and Company in the asymptotic flat spaceline, that again relies on the fact that you can um, see that Einstein's equations can be expressed in terms of an avier stokes kind of equations. And the way I'm gonna be using this is just to draw analogies and prompt the kind of research that we're gonna try or kind of questions that we're gonna to try to ask in particular systems. And perhaps along the way we might find surprises and from them uh, come out uh, trying to explain new phenomena. So the first part of the talk is, is astrophysics. Um, it ties to uh, the discussions this morning. And for, this, for the sake of this particular part of the talk, I'm gonna be thinking mostly or mainly about the detectors on space, so LISA and the PTA uh, that we heard from, from Bernie, in that I'm gonna be thinking that my target systems are supermassive binary black holes, and we're gonna to try to ask a few questions about what they might do. As 
Keep already mentioned, binary black hole systems are already essentially completely under control as far as gravitational waves are concerned. In the process, we will have learned many interesting physics, um, the amount of energy that is coming out, the recoil, realizing these recoils can be extremely large, etc. But I'm going to try to make this black hole do more from us, or for us. So if I think of LISA, one of the important things that we would get, or ELISA, say, uh, out of them is the strain of the gravitational wave sources and the frequency time dependent. But one particular thing that we notice, and this is an expression that, that Bernie Schutz wrote, uh, is that what we measure is the kind of redshifted mass. And so from age and from the frequency, we actually don't get um, the information, I mean, all the information we want, unless we kind of are able to obtain the redshift out. And so it's very important to have an electromagnetic counterpart to actually get this redshift and be able to do precision uh, physics. LISA is an amazing detector. Um, Bernie already alluded to what the signal to noise ratio would be. And if you see how accurate you can extract the masses uh, of the system and the distance, I mean, the accuracy is just outstanding in astrophysical settings. One, one unfortunate side effect, though, is that the sky localization is not so great. I mean, typically, you're going to be talking about square degrees in the sky. And and something that is an unfortunate side of effect of LISA being so good that you can see so far, so when you ask the question how many galaxies are up to redshifts of five or 15, there are just way too many. So the, the, the picture we would like to uh, kind of present for that is this um, image of the Hubble deep space field uh, um, um, observation. Uh, the, the, the patch in the sky that this is covering is arc minute square. And we're saying that LISA will only tell us to within about I mean, degree square in the sky that one particular uh, galaxy has this supermassive binary black hole that is merging. So for instance, in this one, so we're going to have a, a size, uh, of, if we're thinking about the square degree size, it's like this roof, uh, it has a little patch where one galaxy there is the one that hosts the super binary mass, uh, black hole system. So we might as well just go out and try to buy a lottery ticket before we actually try to point to the right one. However, uh, and here is where elect the electromagnetic counter an electromagnetic counterpart would come and help us. Um, there are several missions out there that will be imaging different patches of the sky every so a few days. And so if we actually encounter a strong electromagnetic counterpart, we might actually go after this and help uh, in the detection and in the localization of the source. If we do so, well, the kind of physics we can get out is amazing. I'm just, I'm just going to mention one of them. So we know this luminosity uh, distance versus redshift diagram from electromagnetic uh, observations. We could get an analog which is completely driven from gravitational waves. So we can have the analog of luminosity distance versus a redshift diagram done from gravitational wave observations. And just comparing the two could signal very strong surprises. So in particular, in this context where people are saying that we might have extra dimensions and gravity leaks out, you wouldn't expect these two diagrams to be the same. Whether that's the case or not could either close down that um, window altogether or open it up in an amazing way. So the bottom line for this part is that we need to understand what can produce a counterpart in this kind of system. And what I'm going to be thinking about is, again, two supermassive binary black holes that are orbiting about each other and ask the question, what can they do to produce electromagnetic uh, signals? When these two galaxies, so these two supermassive binary black holes, got together there because of, say, collisions of two galaxies, as they're getting closer and closer to each other due to several processes, there is a point where they get to be around, to orbit around each other. They will have a circumbinary disk that will, whose, as the orbit shrinks, the disk also shrinks uh, as far as the distance of the inner edge with respect to the origin of the binary system. But at some point, gravitational wave effects, which are shrinking the orbital uh, distance between the two supermassive binary black holes, will proceed at a much faster uh, rate than the disk can catch up to. So essentially, we can imagine that at late stages, we're going to have an, acc an accretion disk that is essentially steady, and these two black holes are coming together very rapidly. So I'm going to think about that case and try to uh, see what the counterpart might be. So the first problem is, OK, now we're trying to do astrophysics, or hoping to do astrophysics, and then that makes it we have to face the music. There is a lot of uh, physics ingredients that we have to put in there. 
And even though this may be complicated for us, nature has, doesn't care if it is complicated for us. We actually have to get the picture right. So I'm going to consider a particular uh, case that is sufficiently simple that will let us uh, uh, get some important information. But before I do so, let me take a step back and recall one particular example that has helped us mentor or torment students in qualifiers for years, which is the fact that we know pulsars are, are there, as, as Bernie mentioned earlier. Um, we also observe that pulsars spin, actually spin down, and the typical question is, okay, do a back of the envelope calculation to explain how the spin down, rate, spin down is produced. And the typical argument is, okay, you have a pulsar that has a particular angular momentum, uh, sorry, magnetic momentum in a particular direction, is rotating in another one, there is a torque between the two of them, and that generates electromagnetic radiation through dipole uh, interactions. And you write that the formula is kind of like this. And that's good, it's good to, as I say, uh, ask questions, interesting questions in qualifiers, but that's, the answer is wrong. We know that because if you estimate when, uh, how long it takes for a spin, for a misaligned pulsar to align with its spin angular momentum, it's enough that it sh we should have a population that shows no spin down whatsoever, but that's not what is seen. So there is a piece of this history that is missing. And it took to, uh, was Anatoly Spitkovsky um, in 2006 that actually re mentioned or, or realized a dream of actually including the interaction of the pulsar with its surrounding media, something that has been brought up by uh, Julian and Goldrick in the, in the 60s, mentioning that outside the plasma, simply by vacuum unstable decay, um, you're going to generate a plasma region, and there could be an interaction between the plasma and this compact object going around each other that will help in introducing an effective friction that will slow down the pulsar. And now the expression that you get once you include that effect is something of this form. And the important thing is, A, the magnitude doesn't change a lot when the, amplitude, when the angle changes, and also it never gets to zero because you always have this one contribution there. So I'm going to take a page from that model and do exactly the same thing. So we know black holes, um, when they power AGNs, we think this is powered by a, a supermassive black hole that is spinning. and the, plasma around it is able to extract rotational energy from the black hole. And so this, this is uh, known as the Blanford Snaik effect. And again, you imagine that the region around it has magnetic fields that is sourced by some accretion disk that is at some distance away. And again, because uh, it's the black hole will accelerate straight charges at very rapid, to very, very rapid velocities, those will generate photons, and if they are sufficiently energetic, they will be unstable for paper production, which it will generate further charges, and then you're going to have a cascade effect that will fill this region around the black hole with plasma. When you do that, um, they, or when you postulate that that's the case, Blanford Snag showed that you can treat the problem as a conductor using the membrane paradigm that has induced an induced charge separation, and you can support some circuits that will dissipate energy to some faraway load. Um, and the important thing is that the luminosity will go like the strength of magnetic field that is threading the black hole region uh, square times the spin uh, uh, of the black hole square. So let me just recall a little bit of that, that model. We knew from Wall's uh, initial studies of what would be the electromagnetic distrib field distribution of a spinning black hole immersed in uh, an electromagnetic field, say, that is aligned in the, in the Z direction. In, the, in that uh, solution, the space around the black hole is assumed to be vacuum, but that we're going to ignore. What the solution does tell us is what would be the, uh, the distribution of electric field, and it is this one, so fields come in from the, at the poles and go out at the equator. So now we can imagine that now the region around this is, uh, is uh, filled with a plasma. The black hole, because of this char essential effective charge separation, can, is powering um, an, electro an electromotive force. Um, and that is the, what we can regard as extracting rotational energy from the black hole. If we imagine that there is a circuit, 
where tr charges will go from the pole to the equator and then you're gonna, gonna get pulled upwards, lose their energy here, and then this process continues. If you put those two things together, then you get this result of a squared a square being the luminosity of, of the black hole. However, this is just a picture does it hold in, in practice and a whole slew of numerical simulation using different uh, approximations keep getting the same answer. So it seems that this analogy at least gets it right, but if we're very rigorous, any, I'm gonna go on, on the record that all possible explanations of Glenn force Nyack are completely incomplete and they fail at some moment or another. But again, the fact that we cannot explain it, the numerical simulations all show consistent results um, with respect to this phenomenon. So I'm gonna just use, it, use this analogy and try to push it further. So if we believe, let me not skip this part. If we believe this analogy, there's nothing special about the black hole spinning. A black hole that moves through the magnetic field will create also a charge separation. Remember, we're regarding the black hole as a poor conductor. Now it just moves the black hole uh, through a magnetic field and you're just gonna have, again, an electromagnetic force very much like you would expect simply because you have an analog of the Hall effect that will generate your charge separation on the surface of the black hole and you could establish a circuit again. So if you believe that story, there's nothing particularly important about how the black hole moves. The only thing you need to care about is that there is a motion, relative motion between the black hole behavior and the asymptotic direction of the electromagnetic field that are uh, going through the region where the black hole moves. This situation will be generic. Imagine two black holes that are going around each other are gonna merge the accretion disk is outside, it's producing this magnetic field that will thread this region, and you're gonna have black hole motion. We also sh saw from um, um, Kip's talks, and also uh, um, uh, was uh, shown again by, um, by Bernie Schutz, that there is this kick velocity, that, that this kick that the final black hole can acquire, and again, you're gonna have a single black hole that moves through uh, some region where there is a magnetic field thread. So let me just see if we can push this analogy further uh, and see where it takes us. So first we're gonna do some very simple ex exercise. Let me, let me imagine that I have a black hole that is rotating, that's the standard line for snag picture. Let me turn it around and just give it an angle with respect to the direction of the, of the magnetic field that is threading the black hole. You do the simulations and this is kind of the behavior that you get. So let me just point to this one. This is for different angles and for different values of the spin, one being 0.7 of the black hole, the other one just being 0.1 and you get a relation that looks like this, and you can infer that, just by a fit, that the uh, dependence on angle is given by one plus cosine square. But if you did believe this membrane paradigm, and if you did believe that this analogy can be pushed further, you could have avoided yourself writing a complicated code and, write it and running it for a long time. You could just pick up uh, Thibault Damour's thesis, who computed for a slowly rotating black hole, what would be the charge separation induced on the black hole? and you would get precisely this result. Let me do a different experiment now. I'm gonna have a black hole that is non-spinning, and it's gonna make it, give it a push in a given direction, and it's gonna move now through this magnetic field region. Again, if you use the black hole, uh, mem uh, the black hole analog, uh, this conducting analog, sorry, you would find out that on the conductor you're gonna induce an electric field that goes like V cross B, and therefore you would conclude that the luminosity would scale like the strength of magnetic field square times the velocity square. And these are two simulations, one where the black hole is not spinning at all, you're just making it move with respect to different bodies of velocities and you get this picture. And if you fit this, it fits very nicely a V square line. You now consider exactly the same case but you let it, you make, you give it some spin and you send it through uh, with some given velocities and you get this arc curve which you can very nicely fit as the L square that you had here plus the contribution you would get from just a standard blank for snack uh, process. And again, if you believe this, uh, this duality, if you want, or this dual picture, you didn't have to do this at all. You could have just picked up this paper that was written a long time ago by Drell, Foley, and Rutherman um, that did this study of how a satellite moving through Earth's magnetosphere would behave, uh, could extract energy from Earth, uh, the Earth, the, the the magnetosphere on the Earth. And this was a study done for the Jason Laboratory, for the Jason Group. If you don't know what the Jason Group is, you should ask someone. <laughs> As a foreigner that every now and then goes to the States, I probably shouldn't say more than that. So now I put two things together, one and one, all we see is two. 
So we know that a black hole that moves through a magnetic field would create a jet. Uh, and if you are orbiting, then you expect that two black holes moving through the magnetic fields will have two jets. And this is what the simulation shows. We have two black holes going around each other. These individual jets are uh, defined, emanating from the black holes as the plasma is tapping energy away from the orbital dynamics. And well, the closer they get, the stronger uh, the jet gets. Finally, they merge into a single black hole. Generically, that black hole will be spinning. And then you go back to the standard blank for uh, effect. And this scenario rendition that science came out to, to show this effect. So you essentially, you, these jets are just another space-time tracer. This time, we haven't looked at particular lines of the space-time, uh, as Kip was showing. We actually put some uh, physics ingredient there and just look at what, how they behave. So it would be the, this would be the analog of just trying to describe the gravitational field in this room. I can just point or draw the gravitational field lines or just put a bunch of apples and let them fall. And then from there, we could understand what the gra gravitational field would be in, this, in the room. So in the general case, if you now consider the black holes that are orbiting over each other that are spinning, this is what we find for some fiducial values of the masses uh, we're thinking of 10 to the 8 solar masses and 10 to the 4 uh, gausses uh, being the strength of the magnetic field around the black holes. Of course, this is subject to a lot of uh, fudging around. I mean, this one, it will depend on which binary system you're concentrated on. And this one has a lot of uncertainty. There are models there that would call for one gauss all the way to 10 to the 4, so there's a lot of uncertainty in this value. But besides this, this is the scaling we expect. So there is a contribution, this is for the equal mass case, due to the standard blank for snag, if you want spinning black hole interacting with the electromagnetic field or magnetic field, plus the stuff that is contributed by the boost of the black hole. And then you see that for the very late stages where the velocity gets to be very close to the speed of light, then these could overwhelm that one. And both of them are helping uh, in the kind of luminosity you will get from this purely electromagnetic process. So as I said, the electromagnetic flux act as a space-time tracer, and this is just as kind of observer sphere that is drawn at some distance away from the black hole. And here you see how these two jets are just hitting that sphere. They go around each other till they finally come into a single one that is just there in a very stable fashion. Um, the important thing, the important message is that the inertia of the magnetic field there is not very important. It doesn't affect the motion of supermassive black hole. They're essentially bullies going around uh, hitting this very, uh, a uh, weak magnetic field. And so every single result that you know of supermassive uh, of binary black hole mergers can be exploited. And you can just use this expression, properly normalized if you are thinking of the unequal mass case, um, to determine what the luminosity might be for that particular case. So if you put this message, these numbers there, which as I said, have some degree of ambiguity, you would expect I talk about a, a luminosity that is in the order of 10 to the 43, 10 to the 4 ergs, which could be observed up to a uh, ratio of 1 if there is sufficient efficiency of conversion of this uh, pointing flux energy into observable signals. So this is as far as the concept of uh, observers in space or of detectors in space. Um, in the con on the context of uh, observations of detectors on Earth, I'll just show you two examples and then I'll move on. This Masaru will describe binary black hole mergers, binary neutron star and black hole neutron star mergers um, in his talk. But by and large, the effect of the, this binary object or this compact system on the magnetosphere around them hasn't been included till we started working on this. And so Masaru will work, will show you some simulations that have a lot of realism with respect to the stars. Um, and now the only thing we can, I'm going to add to it is a little bit of what would these objects be doing on the fossil magnetosphere that would be surrounding them. For the case of a single star, which I'm going to think of being the end, the end point of two neutron stars coming together that merge, form a hypermassive neutron star and want to know what's happening, this should be an important source. Whoops, let me see. If, simply by the following observation. Suppose you have a star that has just formed. It has, because of the merger, the, elect the strength of the electromagnetic field will be incredibly high. We uh, estimate uh, different uh, several groups have uh, simulated this. Uh, at the very least, 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 Gauss. So you have a hypermassive neutron star that have hyper strong magnetic fields. 
And now it's going to collapse to a black hole. So just conservation of angular momentum will say the strength of magnetic field will go up as 1 over r squared. The angular momentum rotation will go up because uh, angular momentum is essentially conserved. So if you put all things together, the pulsar spin down problem will give a luminosity that will go up as the star is collapsing as 1 over r to the 6th power. So you start with a star that might have 15 kilometers, it will go to 3 kilometers, you're going to have a very, at the very least a 5 to the 6th increase on the luminosity. And it's not quite, because as you see in this picture, that calculations assume a kind of a quasi adiabatic behavior, but as the star collapses very fast, you're going to wind the magnetic field around it, and that increases the electromagnetic uh, strength of uh, the possible radiation. If you're now considering binary neutron stars, which happened right uh, before, so they, each one has a magnetosphere. As they come together, this magnetosphere begin to interact. And just it, th there could be dissipation of energy. And this is what is showing here. I have two binary neutrons that are going around each other that are going to merge. The interaction of the magnetospheres um, begins to generate this, ele this electromagnetic pointing flux. And it's very important uh, whether the stars have any alignment or not, because whether there could be field reconnections um, a strong field reconnections and energy release will depend very intimately on where the fields may be aligned or not. It's a lot easier to reconnect fields that are this way, so anti-aligned, the anti-aligned case was than the case where they might be aligned. So this is, we're just beginning to get into this business, but it's actually quite exciting, which will add some degree, extra degree of realism to whatever is, but to what is already being done. Okay, now let me completely change topics. Well, to a point. I want to now ask the question, do we know that black holes are stable? So before we were trying to look for observations, now we're just going after a fundamental question. One particular reason why we care about stability of black holes has to do with the uh, cosmic censorship conjecture. And I mean, to just dumbing it down to the highest possible level, one message of cosmic censorship holding would be that we don't need to care about quantum gravity unless we're, uh, as long as we're outside a, bla uh, a black hole, which is a pretty good news because we don't have quantum gravity and we're doing physics all the time. However, if the black hole is unstable, it might lead to a naked singularity, and if it does, it will lead to a violation, violation of cosmic censorship. So we want to know where this ha may happen, and if it does, where it, ha where it happens in a generic fashion, that is, whether typical black holes will give us typically a naked singularity. In 4D, this question has been examined in many different fronts, and in all of them, um, either cosmic censorship has held very nicely, or the violations are uh, very non-generic. That is, it requires very extreme, extreme fine-tuning of the initial conditions, or requires something that we would call unphysical matter. So now we're going to uh, change, and this is, by the way, sorry, this uh, work in uh, collaborations with Franz Pretorius, and everything I said before is uh, mainly with Carlos Valenzuela, Dave Nielsen, Steve Liebling, and other people that are continuously adding or subtracting from the group. Um, so now um, the reason why we're interested in dimensions larger than four are several, and depending on which camp you're in, you may or may not like the answers. So the first one is, well, black holes in higher dimensions, at least at the fundamental level, it's an interesting uh, 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 place to, uh, to ask questions because we know that four dimensions are very special. So depending on which kind you are, you're going to be very happy for me to, uh, if I say four dimensions are special because that's what we like. That's, this is what we experience. So at the very least, um, we know that they are special for that. But if we allow for higher dimensions, we know a lot of things begin to change in a fundamental way. For instance, there are no circular stable air orbits in higher dimensions than four. So that, that makes it already very special. But we know that also, if we look for black hole solutions in higher dimensions, even when we are asked for stationarity, even when we fix charges at infinity, we know black holes are not unique. There are many examples of black holes that for the same charges, you get, you get very different black holes which have different topologies. So just from the fundamental point of view, it would be interesting to understand this behavior. For instance, um, the question of uniqueness. If you add to the uniqueness requirement that you want black holes that are stationary, uh, that have fixed set of charges, and that they are stable, 
maybe you would we could require uniqueness in the higher dimensional setting as we had it in 4D without asking for stability. On a different kind of vein, if, you, if we believe that string theory is providing the correct path to ever to uh, eventually get in a consistent theory of, of, gra of quantum gravity, then the fundamentally, the fu this universe is fundamentally higher dimensional and we have to study it. But even if you don't believe this or you don't believe that, you cannot, or at least from my point of view, you cannot ignore these uh, very exciting developments on the ADS-CFT um, duality. Whether you believe it, it comes because of string theory or not, there is just at a fundamental level, there is this very nice duality between physics on the field theory side and gravity in a dimension higher. And there is a lot of interesting developments coming out of it, and uh, both meanwhile and Horowitz talk, we've covered several of those. And in most of those, the duality of the, the dual state of the field theory is described by a black hole in some given dimension. So from that point of view, we also need to understand how black holes behave in dimensions higher than four. So this is where uh, this question of instability of black strings come in. So this is what's observed uh, already in the 90s. So if you, let's imagine for simplicity, we just have five dimensions. With the extra dimensions, the extra dimensions just a copy of the four dimensions, say, which has some, some proper length, or we impose some periodicity in the extra dimensions. So if you ask in that context, what are the two simplest black holes that you can think of writing that are static? Uh, the two, these two are either just Schwarzschild, four dimensional Schwarzschild cross an extra dimension, so you just have a stack of Schwarzschilds in the extra dimension, or you have one of these Tangerlini black holes, which is essentially a Schwarzschild black hole that describes an S3 rather than an S2 as its horizon. So the question of stability was raised first, or at least attacked first, by Gregor Laflamme in the 90s. And they just essentially, if you want, redid Price's calculation. But they found out that perturbation did admit exponential growth if the periodic, the periodicity in the extra dimension was allowed to be sufficiently high. Essentially, if m is the mass per unit length of the string, the, the mass of Schwarzschild, uh, if you allow the extra dimension to be larger than about 15 times that, uh, then you would have a dispersion relationship that showed exp uh, positive uh, modes that would uh, uh, blow up exponentially. So of course, it's a linearized study, and if we have something that's unstable, we don't know what the system is going to do, because quickly you get out of the, uh, the validity of your uh, linearized study. But they, put, they did something else, and I consider this really beautiful as far as just a fun, a easy piece of uh, fundamental of, of basic physics. They said, well, suppose you have a given amount of fixed mass, and you want to distribute it in a solution that would be describing a hyperspherical black hole, one of these S black holes with a three surface, or you put it in a black string. Well, let's compute the ratio of the areas, or the ratio of the entropies, if you want. And you find out that if the extra dimension has a length above about 10 or 11, then you have a higher area for the same mass if you put in a black hole than if you put in a black string. Therefore, you have higher entropy if you have a black hole than you have a black string. So now you can put these two things together and put a bold conjecture out, um, which says, OK, just perturb a black string. You want to maximize the entropy, so you might want to go from here, or might end up starting from here, ended up there. In the process, you're going to deform your horizon in a significant way. The horizon will pin off, give rise to separate black holes, and then the two will merge and form a single one. So that's pretty nice, but in the process you have to violate something very strong, which is we know, as just as in 4D, in higher dimensions, horizons cannot bifurcate unless they encounter a naked singularity. And so that was a possibility of having a generic situation where you're going to have a black hole, because the only thing we require is the extra dimension to be sufficiently long or longer than the this number of order 10 times the in, uh, mass per unit length. And no matter what you do, as long as you perturb it, it will go and lead to a naked singularity. So now, what is the end state of this system just in full? So people took that bifurcation and naked singularity for granted for about 10 years. Till Gary Horowitz and Maeda came out with a theorem that kind of sent a wrench in the whole system. They prove a, the a theorem that said that horizons couldn't shrink to zero. Uh, well, the theorem says that hor if horizons are going to bifurcate, the affine time of the generators of the horizon should go to infinity. That's what the theorem, their theorem says. 
The conjecture they put forward is that if it's going to take an infinite amount of time to develop anything, it might as well just stay into some R solution that is non-uniform now, and uh, will just go relax into, into that state. And so that was the conjecture. And based in part by this, lots of people went out and tried to find these solutions, and they did indeed uh, find solutions describing non-uniform black strings, so black strings that as you went along the extra dimensions, they would have this uh, non-uniform shape. However, in all of them, if you calculate what the entropy is, their entropy was slower than even the unperturbed black string. So there's no way that you would go into that one um, unless something very funny happens. There were other more radical conjectures about the space and some of them would just, would just have the space and collapsing on itself at, at some point, but I'm not going to dwell on that. In about 2000, we tried uh, to do a numerical uh, study of this problem, and we failed. We just saw some interesting behavior, but it, it just we couldn't help in, in resolving this puzzle. So this is where things stood for a while, but all along, people began pushing this uh, membrane duality picture. Um, again, as I said, you could regard the system, at least using the membrane paradigm, as being described by uh, the Navier-Stokes equations, and mainly Cardoso and Diaz pointed out that there is an instability on the fluid side that would look very reminiscent to what the, uh, we, the black string might do. And this is something we're familiar with. If you play around with your tap water and you have a very thin stream of fluid going down, every now and then you'll see this, it will break out and form little bubbles. This is called the Rayleigh plateau instability. And the, the number of bubbles you'll have and the structure will depend or does depend on the viscosity of your fluid. So in laboratories, people have seen that if you have a, a fluid that is lower and lower viscosity, you have this phenomena called satellite formation where you have a very thin string. It begins to develop bubbles in some regions at the expense of making the uh, stream of fluid around it even thinner. And that process can keep going for a little bit till um, surface tension is no longer able to keep up uh, by keeping the string of the string uh, in, a, in a, 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 and the string without uh, breaking up. So, furthermore, if you look at the dispersion relationship of that problem, it looks like this. This is a, the Rayleigh plateau analog for a fluid, and it looks awfully, at least qualitatively, similar to this one, which is the one that Gregor and Laflamme got. More recently, these uh, analogs that were, or these frameworks that were developed by Bhattacharya et al. and Emperor et al. have established very similar relationships and been able to look at scenarios where, again, the, 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 the similarity between the gravitational behavior and the, and the fluid behavior is quite uh, at least remarkable. So this is where things were, and finally we are able to uh, look at the problem with enough time, and as Kip already showed, we we're able to distinguish what uh, the system goes into. So I'll, I'll just explain a little bit more um, in here. So suppose I'm going I'm to show an embedding diagram. So this picture will tell us what the event horizon is doing at any given time. It will also tell us in redundant information, the size and the color will tell us how big this string is versus in radius versus the extra dimension. And I'm not concerned about the extra dimensions in the angular side because we know those do not affect the picture whatsoever, and we assume that symmetry to allow this code to be something that can be run. I mean, it's already tough to run four-dimensional simulations. Five dimensions will be uh, impossible. So let me just play the movie that you saw uh, from Kip's talk, and I'll try to walk you a little bit on what we see. So as the system proceeds, you see that I mean, there is a region that thins out. You see bulges coming out. Um, interestingly now, if you come in here and you check the length of these versus some I mean, hand-waving argument of what the mass per unit length would be just based on the size, you realize that this is, again, satisfying the criteria for an R instability to take place. And so as you see this thing progress, indeed, that's what happens. Another bubble shows up uh, in the middle, which makes this the regions are only thin, thinner, which again gives rise to an R instability, and the system keeps going this as far as we could push. And we push it for about two months. The very last uh, generation that shows that one took one month to run when the first one took two days. Um, when we estimated how much it would take for the next generation, we stopped. 
So this is again just uh, the same picture we're gonna zoom in in the region. I should say there is no tension whatsoever with my error result, core with my error result. If we do evaluate what is the affine time of the generation of the horizon at even just some intermediate stage with t where time is 160m, the affine time is going like e to the 40. So um, it seems that indeed the affine time will go to infinity. Um, the strings, some portion of the string will shrink to zero size. But the question is, okay, this will give rise to an naked singularity, or perhaps zero mass, and I'll say more in, in a bit. But the question is, what is gonna happen? You could go into a situation where, yes, along the horizon, or along this generator that will go to zero size, you hit I plus, so you, essentially the time of null observers will also go to infinity, so no one, no observer would actually see this taking place. Or it could be that this happens at a finite time of asymptotic observers. So we still have to decide which one is the case. So for that, we need to uh, look at it in a bit more detail. So the first thing I'm gonna show you is just this apparent horizon behavior. So here, the only thing I'm showing is dr dt. So the rate of change of the horizon uh, as time goes on, this, so this is time. And for simplicity, what we're gonna say is that everything in purple shows dr dt being positive. So a ball just coming out. Everything else is negative. So the RDT is negative, the, that portion is getting smaller. So this is the first ball that, ball that shows up. On the other hand, this one begins to decrease, and at some point, a ball comes out um, and gives you this, then on the, on the sides, everything keeps decreasing, but a ball, come out, a ball come out, or a hyperspherical black hole comes out, and the same uh, in the last generation. So this, even if you don't know anything, it begins to look like a very repeated picture, and might tell you maybe there is a fractal behavior here, and you should actually go and calculate it. If you take the length of the curve that you're defining by the event horizon uh, versus time, with respect to some critical time at which you think it will decay to zero size, it behaves this way, where its number is 1.05. One would be a simple fractal, there would be no fractal curve, just a standard straight line. The fact that it's larger than one says there is a fractal curve, but it's not very complicated, it's, very, it's a small number, and that's because we have a very simple fractal structure. Essentially, you're replacing straight pieces by a piece that has a semicircle, and then you go on. So this is what the fractal structure would look like. The other thing is you can measure this horizon area, so the horizon grow area grows as expected, but interestingly, we put a little bit of energy, just a tiny bit of energy in the initial data, and as the horizon area grows, you get to this value. This is the numerical value that you would get if you calculate the, area, the final area versus the initial area, is 1.369. And if you did the initial calculation where you put all the initial mass on a black, a hypervertical black hole, and you took the ratio with that mass defined in a black string, is 1.374. So it actually is the case that the system is trying to maximize, saturate the entropy value. It wouldn't be the case if the mass, if the naked singularity that is leaving out is a massive one. This one, it says all the energy gets sucked in into um, the remaining black hole or the black hole structure. So we want to now say just, uh, just a few more words about what is it that is going on. I mean, already um, you kind of guess. What we're saying is that the bulges could perhaps be described by a super, uh, an S3 black hole, uh, one of these hyperspherical black holes, and the strings that join could be described by this black string. So we're gonna just compute a couple of invariants, uh, curvature invariants, that have been uh, normalized in such a way that if you get a six for these two invariants, you're getting a hyperspherical black hole. If you get a one, you're getting a black string. So this plot shows those two uh, invariants in red and black superposed with the structure that you see in the, uh, in the apparent horizon. And every time you see a ball, you see a region where the invariants are getting very close to six, and when you see a straight line, they're getting very close to one indicated, and indeed, that stage at that given time, which is, uh, uh, which is arbitrarily chosen, is describable by uh, a connection of strings at least locally, uh, with black holes. So the last thing we want to put in here is, well, what would be the case? Does, it, does a pinch-off happen at a finite or infinite time for an observer? 
And so you just measure what the radius of the strings, so the size of the strings in the, in the consequent generations are, and it, it goes on by about a factor of three or four. Um, also, when the strings, the length of the string always gave rise to something that would be uh, unstable to an arguable Laplace instability. So we can put all this information together, and I'm not gonna expect you to read all this, just I'll give you the punchline. You can say, well, the initial time uh, that develops the first generation is completely artificial. You put it in by hand, given your initial perturbation. But from there on, the argument is that it does take place in a very well-defined way by the dynamics of the, of the dominant mode um, governing what's gonna happen subsequently. And so you say, you can ask, what is the time that it would have to wait, given that every generation gives me a string that is one third of the size, um, for that string to go to zero size, and it's a simple geometric si series which tells you the final time is 231M, so it's just very finite, and so the picture is this one. You actually reach the naked singularity at a finite time for an asymptotic observer. The last piece of evidence before I conclude, the last piece of uh, observation, is the following. When we compare with the fluid, just I'm going back to the fluid analogy, an analogy the full solution is not known in, in closed form, it's known via numerical simulations, but at the verge of the pinch of occurring, it is, it is known that analytically, the radius of the thin string that is about to pinch off behaves linearly with time. When we look at our simulations and we compute what would be this the slope of this piece, which would, is describing a piece of the string that actually seems to be shrinking to zero time, it is also equal to minus one, to about 10% to about of numerical error. So let me push a little bit and conclude here. So we started saying, well, if cosmic censorship were, were valid, we didn't need quantum gravity, but we are just showing that at least in higher dimensions, the gravity of time instability shows that cosmic censorship will be violated. It will be generical. It actually applies to many black holes. Many black holes that are known in higher dimensions have an instability or have a state that can be described uh, as having unstable behavior ma by mapping pieces of region of the black hole uh, horizon to the greater Laplace instability. In particular, for instance, this Meyer Perry black hole, which are the analog, the higher dimensional analogs of Kerr black holes. So for this case, the one I described, and all the other ones that can be mapped to it, we can say a few things. So the first one is classically, a naked singularity will arise that will have zero mass. Semi-classically, of course, you expect that something else will happen. So if nothing, there's no extreme correction that will, or higher curvature correction that will come and get in the way before that, you expect that the black hole will evaporate um, just as in Hawking's um, uh, picture. But we, for the full solutions, we need quantum gravity to tell us what really happens. But if we're not going to push the fluid analogy a little bit, we know that nothing drastic takes place at Pinchoff. And this is something that came out uh, last year as a co in conversations with Shiraz, Mingwala, and, and Gary Horowitz in a, in a workshop that we were all talking about this. We know on the fluid side that if you're describing things from, with Navier-Stokes equations, there is a po point where the fluid gets so thin that Navier-Stokes equations are not describing anymore the nature of the, the dynamics. It should be replaced by molecular dynamics to find out what really happens at the verge of the, of this, of the Pinchoff. But there is a, there is a an attractor solution that shows that when these two, when a bowel pinches off, it just goes into a smooth uh, behavior by just smoothing out that little cusp. And that's an attractor solution. So even if we don't know molecular dynamic, any four, four year old kid that is playing out with bubbles knows what's gonna happen when the bubble pinches off. So you can argue, well, if the, this picture also applies to the gravity case, well, maybe you really don't need quantum gravity. We know what's gonna happen. You just need quantum gravity to, to give the last few details of the complete solution. And of course, this is a kind of a provocative um, statement which I'm putting in there. So um, to conclude, let me just say just a couple of more words. So I showed two examples where we just began with this dual or dual or this analogy with black holes and membranes. The membranes told us how to perhaps go after the system in a couple of scenarios that would be interesting. We got more than we bargained for, and that's always what you wish when you started, started some research project. And so now we're in the verge, as, Bra as uh, Bernie was saying this morning, to have this tremendous amount of data that will allow us to look into the universe in a much, or in a, in a completely radical new way. That might come a few years from now, and so we're all very excited, in particular the LIGO India uh, um, 
possibility, so it's very neat. But in the meantime, well, we can all go back to our top well, our water fountains or whatever and just be playing with fluids. In the meantime, we can get to uh, see some interesting behavior. Who knows, maybe it maps to a particular black hole. So thank you. Uh, your work, uh, as well as uh, you see uh, certain works on four-dimensional black holes throwing matter in charged or you know rotating particles, seem to imply. I mean, there is argument uh, going on whether you can you know uh, by throwing in particles also you can you know break the horizon or not. The arguments are going uh, back and forth. Uh, what I would like to ask is either your work or this other, uh, you know, uh, arguments which are going on, uh, are they really concerned with uh, or the connect with the original question of cosmic censorship in the sense that uh, the original formulation talked about the, you know, a collapse of a, a massive uh, matter cloud and the singularity evolving from that rather than, say, black hole collisions or uh, uh, throwing particles in or black hole mergers and so on. So if you comment on that, the actual relevance to the original formulation of cosmic censorship, I'll be grateful. Thank you. Well, so you're right. I mean, people haven't looked at this where you can form these kind of black holes and see the naked singularity. But I mean, these results, I mean, now I'm just going to talk from God, purely a gut feeling point of view. I mean, it would be good. And we actually started in the, in the 2000s to do this project which we then put on hold because the other one started working much better. I don't think there's an impediment to sending in, uh, it might have to be kind of a weird kind of initial profile of, of dust or energy that will give rise to this naked singularity. So, I, I, but in the same token, I can do something, right, I can do what I, whatever I want here to have this kind of critical behavior show up with a stereo, magical, with a magical zero case. And then the, gener the generosity, I will just do by I mean, bugging, changing things here, but not barring this particular piece that is the one that will give rise to the next generation. So I think it can be done. I mean, it's a neat, it's a neat project. Yeah, so this is the dynamical uh, evolution that is going on that is interesting. At the same time, you agree that the study of gravitational collapse is also important. Of course. Yeah, OK. Finish. The similar to the blunt force generic uh, mechanism, in mid 80s, we had proposed the magnetic Penrose process, which had uh, revived the Penrose process for astrophysical application because the original Pen Penrose process, there was a, <clears throat> to put the particle on a negative energy orbit, you required a, a relative velocity greater than half C. But if you consider the magnetic uh, field around the black hole, then that energy can come from the electromagnetic field. And the Penrose process could be very eff efficient. So it was a very similar to the gen um, uh, blend for genetic mechanism. And that's what I had talked in the first ICGC meeting in 1987. Oh, that's, sorry, I don't know about that one. But and this one, I refer that to all explanations of the blind force NIAC, leave at least part of me kind of unsatisfied is that, so I totally agree that the ergosphere plays a fundamental role. Yes. But we just showed that a single black hole that is non-spinning that moves relative to the magnetic field lines also has a jet, there is no Penrose process there. What the heck is going on? I like to understand the simulations are totally telling this and we need to, we need to get it. So I, I, I thought that similarly it may be interesting to consider this magnetic Penrose sure. process as well in the similar. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask you for a little thing. Thank you. Yeah, you discussed about the binary neutron star mergers. You showed the numerical simulation results. So these numerical simulations, apart from the MHT equations, did you also include the general relativistic corrections? Right. So, and this is goes through also for for Bansara. So the good news is that nowadays all codes within the general relativity or numerical relativity community include GR, they include MHT, include with full I mean in full GR. We're beginning to go to take the next steps beyond that. So maybe Masaru will, will show uh, the inclusion of neutrino effects. 
the inclusion of magnetic fields and effects through ideal MHD, which are good to describe what happens in the star, because that's the appropriate approximation, or we think it's the appropriate approximation, to look for inertia, matter inertia dominated regions, but not the outside of the star where the magnetization is high and the density is very low. So the piece that I showed is that in addition to everything the, the community is doing, we think we now know how to also do the outside. And that is crucial to really connect with the observation, the electromagnetic observation. So you can estimate the fraction of energy going into gravitational radiation yeah. and the fraction which goes into pointing flux. Sure, yes. Luis, um, just to I understand it's a, it's a provocation, but <laughs> to react to it, um, I certainly agree that if uh, cosmic chances, uh, censorship is violated, then you need quantum gravity strongly. Uh, I'm not sure I would agree that if uh, sen uh, cosmic censorship hold is valid, you don't need the quantum gravity uh, for obvious reasons. I mean, one, for instance, is that we do know that quantum mechanics exists, and we expect that Hawking radiation exists, so black holes do evaporate. So classical generativity is already violated for there, so, so we do the, and of course, uh, uh, there is initial singularity from which uh, we, we might expect. So I, I, I would put a lot of. I totally agree with you. I just wanted to provocate, and then if I'm saying in this context where a black hole will pinch, will pinch off, well, we need to give the complete solution, but well, by and large, we don't, but there are definitely places where there is no excuse, there is no way out. So you mentioned this uh, black string scenario uh, in extra dimensions. So exactly where is it embedded? Are you thinking of a brain world scenario in which you have uh, large extra dimensions and the black hole is living on the brain? Right, so the, well, that would be one scenario. So the, the, the important thing is that the instability only kicks off if the extra dimension is sufficiently long. Yeah. If it's not, so if you're thinking in the old picture where the extra dimension had to be curled up in a very small region, oh, then it won't work. The, this instability wouldn't be here today. Yeah. But that very same scenario had in the early universe, all dimensions being of the same size, and if you cre did create a kind of a primordial black string, then you had to deal with instability there. But, so the context of this one is, is, as long as you have extra dimensions, and you can define a black hole in a given subset that has a given size, and you allow for this other extra dimension, then you, you have it. Okay, that's fine.